How's everybody this morning? It's a little wet out there. The uh, I told June before church I seen a rainbow the other day, and I said, "Now God, you promised this would stop, so let's let's let up a little bit, let up just a little bit." So yeah, we've got plenty, so we don't need to uh, talk too much more about this rain. So this morning again, we're going to be in Father's Day. Uh, if you're if you're a dad this morning, stand up this morning. If you're a dad, okay. I thought I'd ask who was the oldest dad and who had the most kids, but we won't get into that. You guys better sit down. Again, we're going to talk about dads this morning. I had uh, I was telling Don I I had a, a message all laid out. I knew I was going to do this three months ago, and then at the last minute God changed it. So. Again, he does that a lot. But again, we're going to talk about dads this morning. Da being a dad's a great, a great job. But again, with being a dad comes a lot of responsibilities, isn't there? A dad, a dad's a, uh, he's the protector, the provider, the leader, the, uh, the one that sets the values in the house. But God gives you a very, very, uh, a strict rule. You're you're the leader in that household. But again, being a dad, it, it's great. I remember when I first become a dad, and we were up at Blessings Hospital, and Mindy delivered Adam, and then I thought, okay, <laughs> now what do I do? And I had I thought, look at uh, you know, I just thought I had uh, God give me somebody to throw the ball around with or something. But with that, I got thinking about all the responsibilities that comes with being a dad. And, of course, Adam, he goes crazy and has heart problems, and he tests me right off the, the bat. But with that being said, I remember seeing him and going, okay, Lord, now what do I do with, with this thing you just give me here? And I'm thinking, now I've got all this responsibility and what's Mindy going to do? Mindy's never raised a baby before. Does she even know how? I remember thinking that. And I'm thinking, God, how, how do we know when to feed and what to do? How does she know? I mean, it's going to be good when you're around my mom or her mom because they're going to be able to tell you. But if nobody's around, who's going to tell her what's going on with this baby that's about, well, he's about 10 pounds. He wasn't no little guy. But anyhow, we had big kids. But anyhow, the... Uh, but I'm thinking, who's who knows what to do with him? And but God just intervenes there, don't He? And gives the mothers the the things to to do and what to do and how to do them. And and dads, we just sit back and smile, don't we? We don't. We really don't have much to do with them when they're when they're that size. We just sort of sit back and if we got to change a diaper, you know, we come in with the gas mask on and. You know, something on her nose and rubber gloves and and uh, and you know, and there's probably some of you in here never even changed a diaper. Some of you guys have just got married. Okay, the uh, you didn't tell you know you and Andrews deals when you were kids. You didn't have to do that, but no, I'm kidding. But anyhow, the uh, the you guys got to remember, Dad. We just sort of sat back and did a whole lot of nothing, didn't we? When they're when they're that size, I mean, we wanted to hold them and cuddle them, and but then moms, they're the ones that really dug in. Cause I remember when Adam, he was, uh, I don't know, he he wasn't a year old, and 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 Mindy left him with me for the first time by myself, and I'm thinking it's Christmas time. Mindy goes, I'm going up to my mom's to fix dinner. You get him ready. You give him a bath. You put the clothes on him. And I'm thinking, I can take care of that. And she went on, and the uh, I had him, and I had him playing. I took him in the bathroom. I give him a bath. I brought in, I put all that lotion, Andy, all over his body and dumped about six pounds of powder on him. I mean, I, I had him all fixed up. I went out, and I, and I uh, warmed up the truck, had it nice and warm. And I left him in his play, his little play pen thing there. And so I went there and I started to, to uh, and I had the best clothes on him. I mean, I had him all fixed up, dolled up. And then I started smelling something. And I'm thinking, what in the world? 
I just change this kid. And I go over to the playroom, and it's like, how can a kid do that? And he filled these shoes. He filled everything. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. I had to completely rebathe him and start back over. So let's challenge him. You mothers could have had that. You guys did good. But, again, we're talking about being a dad and, and the ten things Scripture says about being a dad. God was very strict on dads. He, he, gives, us, he gives us a lot of rules and a lot of wisdom. And hopefully as, as dads, we take the time to be dads. Because there's nothing greater than being a dad. Nothing greater than being a dad. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I'm going to just give you a heads up. We're going to do a lot of skipping around because we're going to look at these 10 things Scripture says about being a dad. So moms, mothers, you get a little break today. Maybe one of these days I'll preach Mother's Day and I can hammer on you guys. No, I'm kidding. If you got your Bibles this morning, first turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And the Bible here is talking about, I guess I better turn there too, huh? while I'm running my jaws. The, uh, the Bible, again, with these ten things that the Bible says about being a dad, first of all, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, talks about don't provoke your children. Dads, don't provoke your children. Again, remember, if you're a dad here this morning you're, and, you're, and, and you're older and your kids are growing married, you never, you never stop being a dad to your children. Never. I don't care if they're 45 years old, you're still their dad. Okay? So this carries on. Again, it says, dads, do not provoke your children. Verse 4, chapter 6, verse 4. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training abomination of the Lord. Again, men, you are do not to provoke your children away from the Lord. Don't blame them for things that they haven't done. Don't discourage them. Lift them up. Be a dad to them. Again, you're responsible for seeing that they learn Christian values and that you don't, and it's good that you're letting the pastor, the Sunday school teacher, and others teach your children how to be a Christian, but it's first your responsibility to see that they're, li that they're living in a Christian home. It says there, teach them, train them up. It's your job to see that your children are in church. It doesn't say they're mothers. It says fathers there, don't it? Does it? It says, and you fathers. It doesn't say mothers. It's your responsibility to see that your children are raised in church. Number two, if you want to turn back over to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. And we're talking about big men, dads. Be your, te your first teacher of your kids. Be the first teacher of your kids. And it says in uh, chapter 22, Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way they should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Again, they're talking about training. Dads, it's your responsibility to train up your child in a Christian home. And show him the values of life. Don't blame him for messing up if, you don't, if you're not training him. Don't blame the world for the way he's going to turn out if you're letting the world raise him and train him. It says train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Again, they're going to mess up. They're going to go out on their own. Of course, they're going to think that they're smarter than us. Boy, I could go there right now. Woo! Mm -mm -mm. It's amazing how I don't know anything at some time. But again, we're going to look at three things there as far as training up your child. Be the first teacher. First of all, remember to dedicate 
your child to the Lord. Remember, that child is a gift from God. A gift from God. Your child is a gift from God. So dedicate that child to the Lord. He's the one to give it to you. You just didn't happen to make it because who you are. God gives you that child. Number two, instruct that child in the way he should go. It says train that child. It's your responsibility to train, to train that child. Number three, motivate that child. Give that child the motivation. Train him up as the way he should go in life. You know, when your dad's, when you're at the, at the ball game and your child is out there on the basketball court or football field or running track, volleyball, whatever, you're screaming and yelling, go, 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 the referee, you, they just fouled my kid. But when it comes to church, we don't motivate them to come to church. We're quiet. Yeah, you can go to church if you want to. You can do that if you want to. If you don't want to go, that's okay. Motivate your children to go to church. Motivate them to go to church. Number three. I'll try it again. Try to go through it as quickly as we can. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Dads, we need to be the exemplifier to, for a good life. In other words, men, we are to be the example for our kids. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 says, You are the epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an apostle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the saints of the living God, not on tables of stone, but of tablets of flesh that is of the heart. Again, men, we are the example for our kids to be living by. Remember, they're watching you. Okay? They're watching you. If they go out with you and, and you're got and, and you're hot headed, throwing a fit, cussing, doing the things that you shouldn't be doing, guess what? They're probably gonna be doing the same thing that you're doing. Okay? If they see you drink, guess what? Maybe more, the chances are they're probably gonna drink. They're, if you smoke, more chances they're probably gonna smoke. Why? Because they love you. You're the example. They want to be just like dad. They want to be like dad. So you're the example that you're setting for your children. Dads, we, it's time for us to step up. It's time for us to step up and train up our children the way they should go. Quit leaving it up to the world. If you want to know why the world's a mess, it's because the world is raising our kids. It's time for us to step up and start raising our kids in the Christian values that God said in that book. Amen? That's where our children, you want to change the world? You want to change the world? You start raising Christian kids. You start raising Christian kids. You want to change this country? You start raising Christian kids. Dads, it's time for us to step up. Quit being the slacker. Set the example. Remember, they look up at you. I remember when my boys, when I would coach around and be with them and even other ones, I'd always tell them, guys, remember, there's always fiddlers and followers. If you're a fiddler, you fiddle. If you're a follower, you be the best follower you can be. But people are going to look up at you. Little boys in junior high are going to look up at the guys at the high school level. Girls in the junior high are going to look up at the high. They're going to look at them leaders that are leading them groups, and they're going to say, I want to be just like them. But wouldn't it be more, more greater if they go, I want to be just like my dad? And, there's, and you're setting that example that your kids watch every day. 
Remember, they're watching you at all times. Look, if you see threes back at me, this was a good lesson to me, believe me. This was great stuff. Men, we have to start setting the example for our kids. Number four, dad, you have to be the provider for your family. You have to be the provider of your family. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. First Timothy, I hope you're following along or you're reading above me here. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if you but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. This is a pretty simple one. Pretty simple. Men, we have to go to work. We got too many dads out there running around that's not taking care of their babies. And it's their responsibility. Too many dads running around not taking care of them. They, they have fun making them, just don't want to have fun taking care of them. And that's the problem. Men, we, it's, it's simple. We have to go to work and provide for our kids. It's your job. Go to work. Go to work. There's no ducking out on this one. It's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. Provide for your family. Number five. Oh, I like this one. You can go to uh, Proverbs chapter 13. A good dad, a good dad disciplines his children. Woo, that's a good one, ain't it? He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him, notice that word loves. My mama used to love me all the time. <laughs> and disciplines him promptly. Now, we can go and debate what all that meant. Me and Merle Howland spoke on this just a little bit this morning. Now, that, that spare the rods, now I can tell you what that rod meant at my house. That meant a belt or that meant a switch. And I've told you guys a thousand times, there was never a limb six foot under on any tree at my house. Because my mom done broke them all off. She whipped us right here. That's what that's for. That's what they're talking about. But he who loves him, distance him, him probably. I never forget a time that I mom didn't whip me that I didn't deserve it. And ten minutes later, I was up on her lap telling her I'm sorry that I did it. That's a fact. You go, man, I'd, I'd run, I'd leave that house. She didn't whip us all the time. Just when we needed it. She knew if she, did, if she spared that rod, she would lose control. Believe me, she had three boys by herself. She had no option but to use the rod. I'm telling you. Because there was no man around in our household to, to take care of that. It wasn't when your dad comes home. No, it was just when you got in trouble, mom whipped you right there. Didn't wait. How many of you guys would say amen if we, if the world today would use the rod more? There you go. Yeehaw. Josh, remember this. All you men out there, all you guys, young men just got married or going to get married. You're the disciplined person in your household. You're the one that chucks it out. That's why mom says, wait till dad gets home. Some of you guys probably got some good stories about when dad come home. But you know why? Because back then the mothers knew it was their job. It's their job. It was their job to discipline their children. Why does God tell us to discipline the children? I'm going to stay on this just a little bit long. 
that he who loves him disciplines them probably. Why wouldn't God ask you to discipline your children when he disciplined disciplines his own? If you read in the Old Testament, you can get back there, and God punishes the Jewish people pretty promptly at times when they messed up. And it wasn't a, a little bitty spanking and a timeout. He'd wipe them out if he messed up back then. God gets angry. God gives out punishment. So why wouldn't he ask a dad to spank his kid? Think about it. God punished his own, so that means he wants you to punish your own when they mess up, when they've done wrong. Number six is a great one. Dads, spend time with your children. Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 9. Dad, spend time with your children. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them with when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and when you shall be on the frontlets between your eyes, you shall write the, them on the doorstep of your house and on your gate. What did we talk about? This is Moses giving the laws to the Jewish people. And he's telling the leaders to, to diligently teach it to the children. Teach the law to the children. That way it would just keep on moving on and moving on and moving on. It's just like in this church body, I hope that we're teaching our young people, one of these days, God, we're not going to live forever. I forgot maybe some of you guys ain't figured that out. <laughs> Who's going to take your place here in this building? Are you teaching your kids the values it takes to be good leaders in this church? good young women to be Sunday school teachers or whatever it may be in this church. Are you teaching that to them? That's what he's talking about. Teach the laws to them. Back then, they would actually you take the children and actually put verses of the Bible uh, of their words on, on pouches beside them. They would actually have them all day long. They'd hang them on the doorstep where they would read them every day. They were constantly getting fed the Word of God. But men, spend time with your kids. Remember, when your kid wants you to go outside and play baseball, now you young men remember this, you young dads. The day that that young man or lady goes, Dad, I want you to go outside and play with me. And you get a little bit greedy, and you go, No, I'm going to go fishing with the guys, or I'm going to go do this, or I'm going to go do this. And you miss out on that little time that you have with your kids. And you go on and do your thing. But you remember that time that you missed out on that child's life, you will never get it back. You cannot get them few precious minutes that you had with that son or daughter out there in that yard throwing a ball, playing with dolls, whatever it may be. You can't get it back. I remember when... Adam was born, and I was working construction in St. Louis, and, I, and I'd been to Denver, Colorado, and been different places, and the, and I remember the time I was losing with him. Probably the first year, three years of his life, if you added month, years down to months and months down to days, I was probably only around him about three months. But I could never get that time back, no matter what I do. So think about it. The next time your child wants you to do something with you, with them, you might second think that because you're not going to do it. We'll do it tomorrow. Don't do it tomorrow. Do it now. 
That kid loves you that much that they want to do something with you. If you quit doing, doing the things with them, guess what? They'll find somebody else. And it may not be somebody that you approve of. So still be that dad. Okay? Be that dad of that child. Because you can't get that time back. Take them fishing, hunting, camping. Find out what their interest is. Or they may not like the hunt and fish. Do something else with them. But again, men, remember, I've got them times, believe me, I've got them times in my life with my boys. I went off and done other things rather than do something. And Matt would tee me up. He said, you promised. You said, Dad, you would do it. I can't help it. I'm going over here and going duck hunting or whatever I'm going to do. I can't get them times back. Remember, there's nothing better than spending time with your kids. Nothing better. Number seven, Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Psalms 103, dads, have compassion on your kids. Remember, compassion adds adds, uh, characteristics to you to when you show passion to your kids, it just spreads out to them. They know how to show compassion. Look what this says in Psalms 103, verse 13. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. What I say is a father forgives his children, so will God forgive you. If God forgives you, then you should forgive your your children. The Bible says if you don't know how to forgive, guess what? God can't forgive you. That's what the word says. If you've got that person in your life that I just can't forgive them, Gary, you better learn. Because God's not forgiving you. That's what his word says. But, man, we have to learn to forgive our kids and have compassion on them. Again, God's, God is showing you compassion, so why can't you show compassion on them? Whenever they mess up, again, they're going to mess up. You're going to punish them, but you got to move on. Don't keep it bound up inside of you. And that child, keep it and get rid of it. Have compassion. Learn to forgive your child. Learn to forgive your child. Number eight, dads. Go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I like this little outtake on this. Dads, put your money where your mouth is. James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Dads, put your money where your mouth is. We'll get to that here in just a minute. 26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, This one's religion is what? Useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows and in trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Again, Dad, the kids are watching you. What's it saying there? You're setting the example. They're watching you. Don't come in here on Sunday and do your thing. Then on Monday, do another. Remember, they're watching. And kids are pretty sharp at times. They're pretty sharp. They can see right through you when you're trying to fake it, believe me. Don't fake your religion. Be who you are. Put your money where your mouth is. If you come in here on Sunday and you love Jesus, you praise the songs and you do things, on Monday, guess what? You're supposed to do the same thing. 
Set the example. Put your money where your mouth is. When you go out in the world and you have your son beside you, men, and you're going to work and they see how you handled yourself during the day, guess what? That's what they're going to do. Be the example. Put your money where your mouth is. If you act one way in here, act the same way when you go out there. You're the dad. Step up. If you're going to walk the walk, talk the talk. I'll be honest with you. That's why I wouldn't come to church years ago. Because I couldn't walk that walk and I couldn't talk that talk and I wasn't going to come in here and fake it. That's why I quit coming to church at this church for years. I didn't want to fake it. Didn't want nothing to do with it because I couldn't walk the walk and talk the talk. I feel like I hopefully are doing better now. And I'm doing a better job at it. But men, remember, walk the walk and talk the talk. Don't be two different people around your kids. Because they'll see it. They'll see right through you. Believe me, I know. I've been caught several times. Well, Dad, you said. Well, how come we're not doing it this way? Well, because maybe I'm taking a break from God right now. We'll do it my way. It doesn't work that way. Okay, set the example. Number nine, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. You all should know this. Dads, never give up on your children. Never give up on them. You're your, they're your kids. You made them. You made them. Don't ever give up on them. Of course, this is a story about the prodigal lost son. You guys all know the story. The member, the, the one son come to his dad, and he goes, give me everything. I want it all. Dad said, there you go. And he went out in the world. What did he do? He lost every bit of it, didn't he? You that know the story. He lost every bit of it. Next thing you know, he's eating with hogs because he lost everything. He thinks to himself, man, the, the, the servants that my dad has are living better than me. <laughs> I'm going to go on. Now, look what happens here. Look what happens here. He's coming home, and the dad arose there in verse 20. He says, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, if your son, if you give your money, all your money to your son or half of your fortune that you have, and he went out in the, in the world and blowed it, would you lay him back? I can tell, I know some stories about money and kids, and dads are going, they wasted all that money. I've just given up on it. I ain't giving them nothing else. Maybe money wasn't what they needed in the first place. Think about it. If you give them all your mo all their half of their fortune at a young age and they went out and got rid of it, would you welcome them back in your house? Look here what he done. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and alive again. He was lost, and he is found, and again to be merry. And they began to be merry. Again, he rejoiced, didn't he? Well, I don't know if I could rejoice that or not. Men, don't give up on your kids. Remember, they're going to go out in the world and think they're smarter than you and do the things that they think they need to do, and they're going to blow it, and they're going to come back to Dad and say, Dad, I need this and I need that. What are you going to do with them? You going to welcome them back or are you going to kick them to the curb? Men, 
them, we need to forgive and love them and let them know that the place of rest, refuge is in your home. Learn to forgive them. Always love them. Always let them know that their home is always a home for them. Last but not least, dads, always pray for your children. Always pray for your children. First Chronicles chapter 9, 29. Again, this is David praying for his son, Solomon. David wanted to build the temple. He couldn't. And God told him, he said, you're not going to build the temple, but Solomon's going to build the temple. And he's telling God, and God, give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes to do all these things to build the temple for which I have made provisions. He's asking God for him to keep the commandments, keep his testimony, and keep his statutes. Men, you ever prayed? Have you ever prayed for your kids? Think about it. You've wished them probably for good luck. But have you ever actually prayed for your kids? Think about that. Think about how many times a week you've prayed for your kids. I catch myself often not praying for my kids. I pray for everything else here at the church, and I go, I've got to pray for my kids. What would you pray for your kids? If I asked you to come up here and pray for your kids, dads, what would you pray for? Say, uh, I pray that uh, they make a lot of money, and then that way I could quit working. No, that would be my first one. What would you pray to your kids? First of all, how about if you would pray for them to honor God in all that they do? Second, that they put God first in all the decisions they make in their life. Third, that they just grow up to be good, sound people. Isn't that what you want your kids to be? Good people. When you go downtown, and you have that guy come up to you, I just love your boys. They're such good boys. They're good girls. But she's so sweet. Oh, and your chest puffs up a little bit. Or does the law come to your house and go, your son's dealing drugs. <laughs> Are you praying for them to be good people? Are you praying that they meet a good mate, that your daughter meets a good man and your man meets a good woman? And I'll be honest, I'm not saying because them two are in here, but my son and Lindsay, I pray for them every night before they ever got engaged. I pray, Lord, if this is not the girl for my son, chuck her out of there. What a world to have to raise children in. Would you pray that your kids would raise their children the right way and raise them in church? Would you pray that prayer for your kids? Dads, dads, are you listening? Dads to be, dads that are going to be. Being a dad is, is one of the greatest things. I, I told God, I remember when I was up at the hospital when I had my accident. And I just told God, I said, God, if you just let me live through this 
and let me be your God. And that was the good thing. Let me be your God. Why? Because you're the God for the money. <laughs> Men, you've got a tough job. I wouldn't want your job. But remember what Joshua said, for as far as my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. You have to serve the Lord. You have to set the example, Dad. It's time for the, for, it's time for, <laughs> it's time to quit time out, men. It's time to step up to the plate. It's time to set values in our houses like God meant it to be. It's time to stop letting the world raise our kids. Don't depend on the Sunday school teacher or the teacher, the pastor, the deacon, whatever the man. You're the man of your house. Take the charge of it and do your job. That's the way God meant it to be. It's not a bad job. It's really a fun job. It's, it, it's not a bad job. It's one of the greatest jobs in the world, as far as I'm concerned, is being a dad to my two sons, watch them play ball and doing the things they've done. And how they developed into young men. I got one out of two right, Matt. Nah, I'm kidding. (laughs) Nah, I'm kidding. Are they going to be perfect? No. You weren't perfect. You're not perfect. They're not going to be perfect. Remember, men, as long as you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and in all acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. If you keep God first in your life and you keep God first in all your decisions and you keep God in all the ways that you live your life, guess what? It's a pretty easy job. If your kids see you coming to church and serving God, guess what? They'll want to serve God. They come on Wednesday night. Guess what? More likely they won't come on Wednesday night. If they say, that, yes, they see how you live your life. People look, they love you. They want to be like you. <laughs> Some of you may be sitting there and going, well, if they don't turn out like me, <laughs> maybe we don't want them to turn out like you. Why am I telling you guys all this? I want to tell you, just like I told you a while ago, When you miss out, dads, listen up. When you miss out on that opportunity to be with your children, you are missing out on one of the greatest things you could ever be given. I'll tell you why. Because I never got that opportunity. 1965, my dad decided to drive drunk between between Fielding and Jerseyville. Decided to get to one tavern to another, alcoholic, 1 o'clock at night. Wife and three boys at home. <laughs> Tries to make it to the next tavern, flips his car, and, and he dies. My dad lives, uh, is buried over Jerseyville. Has never seen either one of his three sons grow up. One nine, one four, one, one what even one Jim Bob wasn't even a year old. We've never spent time with our dad. But listen, God. <laughs> I'm not trying to put God has put other men in our lives to show us what a dad is, the right men in our lives, thanks to my mother. And I'm talking about guys just like, I'm not going to sit here and point out guys, but there's guys in this room that I, you guys know and love. I look up to you guys, how you handle your family, how you, you serve your children, how you raise your children. But I've never got that opportunity to be with a dad. Dads, think about it the next time when you you're doing the stuff you're not supposed to be doing. Think about that. If you lose out on them opportunities to raise your children, then don't be crying to everybody going, man, I just don't know what happened to my kids. Well, you never was around to raise them. Never was around to make teach the values into them that they needed growing up. You weren't there. You weren't doing it. Is it time to change? Yes, it is. It's time to change. If you're not doing it, it's time to change. 
Jim, I'm telling you, you got a, you got a, a big stake. Big stake. I've even put myself up on a higher one, haven't I? If you'd have told me 12 years ago I'd be doing this and standing up in front of you, I'd tell you you was crazy. Because, number one, I probably wouldn't even be in this building. And to tell you all a fool for even building it, <laughs> that would have been my attitude. But I put myself up on a little bit ha- higher standard, haven't I? Speaking of the truth. Everybody looks. You think my boys look at me now a little harder than what they did before? Think about it. Men, they're doing the same thing to you. You're on the stake. They're looking at you. They're depending on you to teach them the Christian values that God meant to be in in his word. It's time to step up. Again, if you want to change the world, you change your household. You change how you're raising your kids. If your kids ever seen you pray, your kids ever seen you read a Bible, kids ever seen you do that? They see dad come in the church, they want to go see him, go back out, go watch the Cardinal game. They ever seen you worship God? Have they ever seen that? They read your Bible, pray at the dinner table. You ever done that in front of your kids? (laughs) That's a tough one, ain't it? It's not tough. Do it. That's what God wants you to do. Your sons and your daughters see you doing them kind of things. Guess what? That's what they're going to do. Well, my dad prayed at my table. Now I make my boys pray at the table all the time. Why do they pray? Because why? Because they've seen dad pray. That's where they learn it from. Because they've seen me do it. Where they learn to pray from me and from church. It's where they learn to pray. Why do they want to go to church now? Because it's a pretty church. Why do they want to go to church? Number one, they're safe. Number two, they want to come and worship God. And number three, because they want to go to church with their family. Think about that. Young men, think about that. You men that don't have children yet, you men that have young men, uh, daughters and sons, the ones that are just about ready to have them, think about that. Tie the skills to hand. Let's all stand. <laughs> Number one, for, first, my, if. If you're here this morning, Dad, and this is to anyone, Dad, how this all start? You can't start raising that child in a Christian home until you become a Christian yourself. Remember, God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. That's where it all starts. None of this rest of this stuff that I've been mouthing about makes any difference if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's where it starts. Men, think about it. How are you going to raise that Christian child if you're not a Christian yourself? Dads, we have, dads, Christian dads, we have to start taking our own and making Christian homes and raising good Christian men and women in our household. That's how you're going to change it. That's how you're going to change this community. That's how you're going to change this state. That's how you're going to change this country. That's how you're going to change the world. Think about it. I want everybody to bow their heads for a second. Dads, this, this altar's open right now for you. You prayed for your family lately? Pray for that son or daughter that's having trouble. Have you prayed? If you need to come up and say, God, I'm just going to start all over again. I, I'm, I want to raise my kids in a Christian home. Mothers, this is open to you too. Just under the ministry of the Lord.
kids? What's the Bible say about you? Young men and women in here, what does it say about you? We all got a dad. When's the last time you prayed for your dad? When's the last time you prayed for your dad? Your dad, I don't take it for granted. Dad's going to be around all the time because he's not. But do you pray for him every day? Would you give him the wisdom to raise you the way that you're meant to be raised? Then again, you don't stop being a dad. You're a dad forever. God's place.